Do you know what Jordan Peterson thinks about Bitcoin and about the future impact of Bitcoin on the society? No, I don't actually. Um, we're hopefully going to be talking to him soon about that. We did a, a book club on his book, Maps of Meaning, and he engaged with us about it. So we're hoping to deliver the orange pill to Mr. Peterson. The orange pill. Yeah. <laughs> I think his audience um, is one of the most important audiences in the world to understand Bitcoin. These people that are conscientious and responsible, um, I think they'll quickly understand Bitcoin's value proposition and help elucidate it to the world. I'm trying to remember what he said about, about it. Basically, I think his support of Bitcoin is grounded in the kind of people who are opposing Bitcoin. Mm. So he, mm -hmm. without understanding Bitcoin, he starts to like Bitcoin because of the people who are opposing it. <laughs> you, he, he's, you, you know, you start to, I mean, that's partially why I am interested in Bitcoin. It's like all the people in, uh, in power mm -hmm. and all the kind of shady, fraudulent, uh, non-genuine people, or dismissing Bitcoin yeah. uh, are making me think, hmm. One, one of uh, Jordan's definitions of God is, he says, God is found in the truthful speech that rectifies pathological hierarchies. Hmm. And I think that is a beautiful definition of what Bitcoin is doing in the world and that we have this pathological hierarchy called central banking by which the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, that is used as a mechanism for perpetual theft and funding warfare at a global scale. Uh, like Ron Paul said, it's no coincidence that the 20th century of total war was also the century of central banking. Um, when you have an institution of currency counterfeiting, which the central bank is, you are no longer bounded by your own balance sheet when you go to war. You don't have to just go to war on your own resources. You can now pillage the Commonwealth and pull for the savings of society as a whole before you go bankrupt. And indeed, this is what Hitler did, right? Hitler hyperinflated uh, in the Weimar Republic to, to fund his war efforts. Um, and frankly, every dictator, every world war, every internment camp in history was made possible by the weaponization of money in fiat currency. So I hope, I know Jordan Peterson is a huge proponent of free speech. And I think that's ultimately at, it, at its deepest essence, that's what Bitcoin really is, right? It is just the purest form of monetary speech we've ever had. And by purifying that primary operating system of human action, I think we can eliminate this pathological hierarchy that is unfortunately the dominant institution in the world today. Yeah, I'm definitely, especially with these explorations of Bitcoin, uh, this journey I've been on, I'll revisit some of the th some of the aspects of human history that I've been looking at, like Stalin and Hitler, with a from a perspective of a monetary perspective, mm -hmm. like what are the effects of inflation? Mm -hmm. How was it used as a tool in? Um, in gaining power, in maintaining power, in manipulating the populace, in doing, um, in inflicting suffering and uh, I would say evil onto the world. It's interesting. I. It's interesting. I'm gonna have to sort of go back into the whole. So I tend to f focus more on the human nature mm -hmm. and less about the tools Mm. that human nature leverages to affect change. Mm -hmm. But you're right that uh, in some sense, money is a, a tool which can be uh, effectively used to uh, perform moral and immoral actions, depending mm -hmm. on how it's used. And there's a feedback between the two, right? There's um, specifically with money itself, it's, the incentive, here's the way I've been posing it lately, is that I actually think, we typically think of people as good or bad, or we're, again, trying to label people all the time. But I think people and their characters are emergent properties of the incentive structures they inhabit. Yeah. So, you know, 
what does Charlie Munger say? Don't sh show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome kind of thing. This is a flawed incentive structure we've been operating within. Now, I'm not, I'm not speaking to the intention. People want to argue with me all the time. Like, Jerome Powell's not a bad guy. He's doing his best at the central bank. He's doing what he thinks is right. That's fine. Whether that's true or not, it actually doesn't matter. The intention is divergent from the outcome. The institution that they are running is premised on deception and theft, and it is handicapping the productive economy. So when we're even the terms we use, printing money, you're not creating any new value. You're not infusing the economy with anything, any new productive factors whatsoever. You're just harvesting the economic surplus created by entrepreneurs in the marketplace. There's, it's impossible to add any value to an economy by increasing the paper claims on its savings. So um, there's a feedback loop between man and tool, between creator and created. And I think we have to honor the relationship above either one, right? Trying to put the right people in the system or just build the right system. We need both. Do you think the interesting question of whether the people that are in control of central banks or in positions of power there, if they themselves are malevolent, if they themselves are bad actors, or they're simply like leaves floating along the river, sort of just a cog uh, in the machine, an ant and an ant colony that operates in a certain kind of way. Like, where do you put the blame? Do you put the blame on the way things are operating onto the individuals or onto the system itself, the idea behind the system, where, and is it useful to place the blame somewhere? Because for me, it might be useful to understand that in order to figure out what the solution is. I tend to not put the blame on the individual. Like I, I tend to believe most people are good and want to see themselves as good. And, and so in that case, it's very difficult to be truly malevolent as you would need to be to control, to gain centralized power mm -hmm. at the large scale. But I know a lot of conspiracy theory theorists and just a lot of people think that there is evil mm. humans in the world mm. that seek power, maintain that power, and then use that power for bad purposes. I think they're just people. And they're just trying to get something for nothing, like all of us do. <laughs> I like and, this framework of thought that you well, have. Well, yeah. honestly, yeah. and that's what the central bank is, is the ultimate institution to get something for nothing. You <laughs> yeah. get a perpetual income stream, the ability to acquire more and more territory in the world through monopolizing the supply of money. And you can literally print money you can buy your way out of anything and buy your way into anything in the world so it is i think the most not say the most but a group of very intelligent people put this thing together and figured out how to get something for nothing in perpetuity um by clouding people's conception of money and you know if we look at the central bank is it's been around for a while but the latest implementation uh, here in the U.S. is the Fed. You know, it's about 100 years old. It's an analog age institution that I think has lost a lot of its relevance in the modern age. Um, and I, I don't think it will survive the ever galvanizing gaze of the digital age. There's just too much sunlight, um, too much transparency today. Ideas move too quickly for something like this to remain relevant. But there are just people, they are just seeking something for nothing. But I think when you concentrate that much power and that much control, that much wealth into the hands of few, it does change. Uh, Hayek argued that the nature of power, again, it's something that we all sort of desire. We, to be completely powerless, you're really unhappy, right? If you're totally powerless, you're a slave. Someone else tells you what to do. You have no autonomy. It's miserable, right? So there's this it makes the consolidation of power alluring and that we want to protect ourselves from that slave state, let's say. But like many things, it can be taken too far. And when you concentrate power into too few hands, Hayek argues that it actually changes, it transforms. It becomes something much more intoxicating than it would be if it was held in a more distributed way. And I think that gets into a lot of these, you know, the I don't know if they call themselves elites or people call them elites or whatever, like um, 
let's say shareholders of central banks, people participating in the World Economic Forum, things like this, they come, I guess the incentives, right? The incentive schema they're in is rewarding them constantly, telling them everything they're doing, saying, and thinking is correct because they just keep getting richer all the time. And it leads you closer to this definition of evil, which um, in the book Paradise Lost, Friedman said, evil is the force which believes its knowledge is complete. So these people become more and more convinced that they have the plan or they have the course of action that will save the world, that if everyone would just listen to them, that they would lead us to the promised land, right? Whether this is Bill Gates saving us from a climate crisis or uh, any of these other economic policies that are targeted at a certain outcome, but almost always diverge almost perfectly from that outcome, creating its opposite effect. Um, I think that's the problem, that we have this mechanism that can concentrate wealth and power into the fa- into the hands of so few that it leads to the proliferation of evil, um, meaning that it convinces people that their knowledge is complete. Whereas something like a Bitcoin almost forces the opposite outcome. It in a Bitcoin denominated world, in a pure free market, the consumer is sovereign. So you cannot earn value in the world unless you are serving your fellow man, unless they have through, expressed through their buy and sell decisions in the marketplace, right? You've created a satisfaction of a particular want that they value so much. They've acquired so much of your good or service that you've become rich. You can only maintain that position of wealth so long as you continue to serve your fellow man. So it, it changes the incentives such that dominance in the world is no longer can no longer be paired with coercion. It has to be paired with competence. And it's that's that's how this when we say Bitcoin fixes this, that's what we mean. Like it restores that skin in the game, that balance of incentives and disincentives that help us properly navigate reality. And it prevents the buildup of systemic rot like we see with the central bank. 